It's my understanding that Hofstra has also um, graciously welcomed one of our Texas finest jurists, uh, Supreme Court Chief Justice Wallace Jefferson, who in 2009 delivered the keynote address at Hofstra's commencement ceremony and received an honorary degree. You did very well inviting Wallace Jefferson to your campus. And I want to ensure you that, assure you that you have done marvelously well in inviting Susan Fortney to your campus. I looked up the description and qualifications used to select the Howard Lichtenstein Distinguished Professor of Legal Ethics. The law school looked for a distinguished scholar and teacher to promote Hofstra's commitment to the field of legal ethics. The qualifications included a distinguished record of academic achievement, check, superior teaching ability, check, significant experience in the study of legal ethics, check, and prominence in the professional ethics community. Check, 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 check. Hofstra could not have found a better candidate who embodies these attributes. I first met Professor Fortney when I called her Dean Fortney at the Texas, at Texas Tech School of Law. And she very graciously hosted me there. And we shared many discussions on professional ethics issues. This is her passion, as you are aware. And this has been her passion for many years. She served as a professor at Texas Tech from 1992 to 2011, where she was promoted to associate professor at the earliest possible time. She is a sprinter and later to full professor by a unanimous promotion vote, and she ultimately served as the interim dean. Professor Fortney has written at least three books and over 34 articles that have made great strides in the academic study of legal ethics. Professor Fortney is an elected member of the American Law Institute, and she was selected as an inaugural member of the National Institute on Teaching Legal Ethics and Professionalism. In addition to her outstanding scholarship, Professor Fortney is a powerful teacher, voted by the law students at Texas Tech as the most influential Texas Tech professor. Professor Fortney has been recognized by both the Texas Bar and the ABA. She was selected by the Texas Bar Foundation to receive the Lola Wright Foundation Award in recognition of her outstanding public service in advancing legal ethics in Texas. She also serves as the ABA's peer-reviewed ethics journal board member. Although Texas already misses Professor Fortney, I know that she will expand the already very impressive legacy of this chair. As you know, perhaps probably better than I do, Howard Lichtenstein was a prominent senior partner at Proskauer Rose, and he was an authority in administrative law and a strong supporter of teaching legal ethics. Professor Fortney succeeds Professor Roy Simon, who is retiring after serving for a number of years as the Howard Lichtenstein professor. He has made valuable contributions through his books and numerous articles to understanding the rules of professional conduct that apply here in New York. I understand that New York pr practitioners call his book, that book that you have there, the Bible, affectionately, although he says he never calls it that. <laughs> he very graciously presented me with another one of his books on the model rules uh, at, before we came in today, and I will treasure it, and I promise to read it on the plane on the way home. He has helped set the national standards of ethical behavior. And of course, there is the first scholar to have hold, held this chair, Professor Monroe Friedman. Recognized by many as the first to make legal ethics a serious academic specialty. In addition to the other accolades that has been given him, a professor at my alma mater has described Professor Friedman as the Holmes and Brandeis of legal ethics. Although no one would ever confuse me with being a Holmes or a Brandeis, I would be remiss if I did not share with you some thoughts on legal ethics today as we celebrate legal ethics.
and the important work that you do here at Hofstra for Legal Ethics. I would like to remind us, and those in this room already know, that legal ethics requires more of us than having the good manners we learned as children to play nice, not hit people, tell the truth, and say you're sorry. Although there was a popular book about 25 years ago saying that all I ever really needed to learn, I learned in kindergarten. All I ever needed to know, I learned in kindergarten. And people have made a living giving CLE speeches saying all I ever need to know to be an ethics, ethical person, I learned in kindergarten. And although one Texas judge has recently invited lawyers to a kindergarten party in his courtroom, I still believe that the practice of law and the complex issues associated with legal ethics in particular are not kindergarten subject matter. While good manners in dealing with opposing counsel and the court will get you far, and sadly they're too often abandoned by some attorneys, lawyers in the real, real world are faced with difficult and complex issues in dealing not just with each other, but with clients and with the public trust. Sometimes being thoroughly ethical requires complex analysis and actions that are not intuitive. Some of the oldest problems in legal ethics are also the most complex. Indeed, many of those problems still confound even the most brilliant legal thinkers of our modern era. As you know, in 1966, Professor Monroe Friedman himself struggled mightily to suggest a solution to what he called the three hardest questions facing criminal defense lawyers. One, is it proper to cross-examine for the purpose of discrediting the reliability or credibility of an adverse witness whom you know to be telling the truth? Two, is it proper to put a witness on the stand when you know he will commit perjury? And three, is it proper to give your client legal advice when you have reason to believe that the knowledge will tempt him to commit perjury? Even with Professor Friedman's thorough, thorough analysis of these issues many years ago, in fact, the year I was born, we continue to struggle. <laughs> it was many years ago. We, we continue to struggle mightily with these problems, and they continue to stymie lawyers and moral philosophers alike. It is tempting to try to sidestep these issues with simplistic word usage to blink into the abyss and offer hyper-technical definitions of knowledge or of criminal intent to end run around the real complicated problems that these questions continue to pose. Our duty to the integrity of our profession, however, requires us to grapple head on with these complex issues in a manner worthy of the trust of the citizens whose liberty we safeguard. Accordingly, no matter how intractable these problems may appear, we must continue to strive to deepen our understanding of them.